Hey, what's up guys? So in this video, I wanted to talk with you about the topic of feature creep, also known as scope creep. What exactly is it and why it's such a huge problem, but also conversely why it's such a vital part of our creative process. We'll look at how to recognize the difference between nasty old feature creep and actually building important systems that our game needs. And I know all too well about these matters of feature creep and scope creep. I've been working as a game developer for about 10 years, making games for other people and companies, as well as making my own games as an indie developer. I'm actually working on my own solo game project called Blood and Mead. It's a Viking combat adventure platformer based in a vibrant landscape, mixing traditional platforming elements with puzzles, light RPG elements, and a really satisfying and impactful combat system. And true to its name, Blood and Mead, there's plenty of blood and a bit of pig riding. It's actually going to be pretty damn cool, so drop a wish list down below. What exactly is feature creep? Well, to put it simply, it's the creation of work that falls outside of the originally defined scope. So unplanned systems, mechanics, levels, art, and otherwise, which are introduced during development, which may or may not improve the game experience, but will most certainly add to the overall work time. Every game, whether AAA or indie, will have a degree of scope creep in the process of development. And that's not inherently a problem at all. In fact, I would say it's an expected part of the process. You see, games, like any other creative process, is iterative and requires innovation during production. You see, if we were to stick strictly to an original game design document scope, without adapting to playtest feel or kind of realizations that we've made during the process of development, the finished product will likely feel lackluster. On time and on budget, maybe, but hollow probably. And that's not hollow night. That's, yeah. And that's because games have to be played. They have to be felt. You know, it's, it's not until you actually feel it out that you know if something's working or not in the context of the game, experienced firsthand. Often what we think might be an exciting or interesting idea on paper, once prototyped, turns out to not be all that interesting or doesn't quite capture the experience we hoped it might, at which point it requires something more, some kind of innovation or improvement. You know, some people might automatically then classify this already as feature creep. But really, it's just a normal process of game development. And it's not uncommon for other developers that you might have, you know, friends or whatever, to tell you cynically that your new idea sounds like feature creep. You know, oh man, yeah, good idea, but that's feature creep. But to not allow yourself to creep at all, to be so rigid that you never step beyond the original constraints can lead to missing out on important breakthroughs and innovations. And it's these innovations that could be the difference between selling 10 copies or 1 million copies. One million copies. I once worked for a game design studio that was very rigid with their game design document. It was like a holy document of sorts. That often ideas that were proposed that were not documented in that original first draft would be dismissed as feature creep. And that's a bit of a problem. As a game designer and game developer, I would often find myself in uh, debates with production, you know, fighting for revisions to the game design, um, which were absolutely critical as I saw it to the experience. And uh, in these commercial settings, um, this attitude is often driven by budget and, you know, timelines and these kind of constraints. So it can get a little bit fuzzy and it's, it's a bit difficult. But as an indie developer, you have a bit more flexibility to make these um, adjustments. A bad game delivered on time and to budget is still a bad game. You know, so, I mean, what's the point? What are we trying to do here? Are we trying to make cool things and fun experiences for people or just try to deliver things to budget and on time? But at the same time, you know, a great game that is never completed is... What exactly? There's a point of diminishing returns with features where a game has all that it needs and we easily fall into the trap of perpetual innovation 
where we keep trying to innovate further and further, stuffing more and more into the experience, adding hundreds or thousands of hours to our dev cycle, and ultimately not really improving the game beyond its original scope. It's like overfilling a petrol tank, where the petrol tank can only take so much fuel, yet we keep trying to feed it more, feeling as though we're somehow adding more value. But really, it's just getting um, recirculated out, and all we're doing there is standing there wasting our time and money. And this is all linked to another issue I often see, and have dealt with myself many, many times. As developers, we often try to stuff every single system we can think of into the game we're working on, leaving nothing on the table as if it's the last game we'll ever make and we want to cover all our bases, you know, and a multiplayer RPG, Rocket League, farming sim vania with turn-based card battles. You know, a real Frankenstein. Really, the situation is probably a more subtle than that and harder to recognize. And it's typically the simple extension of existing systems because we get this feeling, this urge that the game needs it, you know. You come to this realization midway through development that, hey man, I really need this system. This is what the game needs. But we don't realize the implications it might have on the larger game design. New systems can end up being um, very problematic for the rest of the game. You know, breaking design rules or creating paradoxical relationships between other systems. And it's hard to predict these issues. You know, foresight is useful here. You need to think carefully before deciding you will add, you know, a double jump to your game character after you've already spent hundreds of hours um, designing levels. Because the likelihood is that such a seemingly innocuous system like a double jump will have far-reaching ramifications, touching areas of the game that you couldn't possibly expect. So think very carefully about how a new system might impact others. This is where a game design document is actually very useful because it's a reference for cross-examination. You know, you can see how this system might affect this system. It's kind of this overview effect and problems emerge a lot more clearly and easily. More does not mean better. Any competent chef will tell you that to make a good meal or a recipe, you need to balance the ingredients with restraint so that they kind of work harmoniously together with no one ingredient overpowering the rest. You know, game design can be quite an organic process. Things change and we have to be able to adapt, but we must also show restraint and discipline especially when you are working solo as an indie. As indie developers, we're often responsible for design, coding, writing the initial scope. And so it's very difficult to um, show restraint when we are the ones responsible for everything because, you know, <laughs> yeah. There are no hard rules. You know, each game is going to be unique based on the developer or designer's um, personality and workflow. And it's rather intuitive, but... With time and experience, you get a lot better at predicting what will and won't work and um, recognizing feature creep. And that's important to be able to know the difference between a system worthy of adding that will actually elevate your the game experience versus plain old nasty feature creep. So what I like to do is this. Before I add some system or make some dramatic change, I ask myself, how does this choice improve the player experience, if at all? And does this add any real value to the final product? Because often the ideas we have are not added for those reasons, but rather it's a case of the developers trying to flex their muscles, building systems just for the sake of it, for technical merit, basically. Just because our system is cool to you, the developer, does not mean the player will find the same level of appreciation. Early on in my own game, Blood and Mead, I built this complicated crafting system, allowing for collection of different recipes and ingredients to craft mead that had different powers. It was a very cool system. You know, technically, other developers would have been very impressed and appreciated it. For the players, it would likely have been nothing more than an unnecessary complexity. So I pulled it out. I downgraded the system to upgrade the overall experience. 
And conversely, sometimes what you might think is feature creep might turn out to be a vital system that your game actually needs that you missed in your original design scope. You know, in my own game, the character was originally limited to only throwing axes. It was kind of inspired by the earlier Wonder Boy games. But I quickly realized when playtesting it that it was horribly boring, like it wasn't going to be enough. So I added a fully fledged um, combat system, you know, combos, power up attacks. The decision did feel a lot like feature creep at the time, but it actually brought back so much to the overall game experience, making it more exciting and more engaging. And it created a lot of good um, footage opportunities to make the game more shareable. So it was definitely worth it. And that's the point, right? To make a more fun experience for the player. So you've got to keep your eyes out for those things, because as mentioned before, those choices might actually be the diamonds in the rough that make the game perform well or fail, depending on if you find them or not. By the way, if you guys are interested in getting into games and don't really know where to start, I also make um, Unity asset packs, starter kits basically, for people looking to get into Unity game development and give them an adequate starting point to make their own games. Currently I've got like a car one, and I've got a platforming one and I'm working on more. So keep an eye out for those. And a big thank you to my Patreon supporters. I really appreciate your support, guys. See you all in the next video. And as always, all the best on your game dev adventures.